Welcome back to another episode of The Circuit. I am Roger Schumann, and today I'm very fortunate to be uh, with my friend, Steve Johns. Steve, welcome to The Circuit. Thanks, Roger. Good to be here. So uh, first off, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, you're listening to this pod this podcast with one cause. Steve, can, can you describe it at a high level, what the company does and the, cu the customers that you serve? Uh, absolutely. So let's start with our vision or our why. And I'll, I'll say that that's to help build better tomorrows. And I know that sounds pretty broad based, but how we're doing that is by providing digital fundraising solutions to nonprofits. And we help them maximize fundraising results by supporting auctions and galas and dinners and golf outings, runs and walks and rides. And so a lot of event fundraising, but also online fundraising. And so uh, our customers are about 5,000 nonprofits across the country, representing causes like fighting disease, improving education, fighting poverty and homelessness. And I guess what I'd say is maybe generally just fixing what's broken in the world. Yeah. So 2008, one cause, I guess it was BidPal at the time, um, yeah. was first to market with a mobile bidding or with mobile bidding for fundraising. Why was that the pain the company focused on uh, at that time versus online giving, event management, and the other solutions that you've added to your portfolio? It's it's an important question. I, and remember, I wasn't the founder of the company. I, right. I joined the company in 2014 as the CEO. But I do know that there was a, a real particular inefficiency in that particular segment of fundraising. And if, if you've ever participated in a silent auction and used paper bid sheets, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you can see how fundraising is not maximized. And you can see that the value proposition to come to a nonprofit and say, hey, we can take that paper, that really kind of paper-based fundraising effort and digitize that and use a mobile device to help you streamline that. You can see where there's true value. And what happens with the paper bid sheets is you put in a bid, you walk away, you enjoy your evening. You might even forget. You know, there are some people who like guard the bid sheets. And that's actually the experience that the founders of the company went through as well. They attended a fundraising gala. They had hopes to really support the gala. And they walked away. They went to the bar. They had some dinner. They had some fun. And so, you know, compare that or contrast that to now you're at event, an event. You're getting text messages throughout the evening that you've been outbid. You're getting notifications and alerts from the organization that uh, certain, you know, when the items are closing or if there's no items to bid. So you can really see how fundraising multiplies and, and it really lends itself to, to digital fundraising, mobile technology, so much more so than online fundraising. And so, and the market is huge, Roger, and it's still growing. And again, what we found out during the pandemic is everything that we've been doing in person can also be done with a virtual extension as well. And so I think, again, that extends the reach of the, the fundraising effort and really extends and improves the yield uh, on a per event basis. So it's not just the three or 400 people who are attending in person, it's the thousands of people who can attend also just using their, their uh, portable, uh, their mobile device to, to bid. Yep. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about that later, that, that pivot. But what I find interesting about nonprofit or, or giving tech companies is just how many of them are based here in central Indiana. So we got One Cause, Onboard, uh, Bloomerang, Givelify, even Blackbaud has a location here. And then there's Boardable, where you happen to be uh, on the board uh, for that company. What is it about Indiana that's, that's fostered so many of these companies? And do you see uh, much knowledge, share, or talent between the organizations? You know, I think what you've just described is something of the basic building blocks for, let's call it an ecosystem in Indianapolis and maybe extended to the central Indiana region. So so an ecosystem, you first, you need people, right? And so you mentioned a couple of companies that somebody like Jay Love is involved with. And so Jay Love was a trailblazer and he started eTapestry, which was sold to BlackBot. And that's, they stayed here as BlackBot. And so that's why you see um, the Blackbaud name in and around Indianapolis. And then then what Jay did is he reinvested his experience and his capital and started Bloomerang. And now that's grown to over 200 employees. And and I think I think not coincidentally, he sold eTapestry to Blackbaud in 2007. And that's right about the time that the founders of BidPal were coming together 
which was the predecessor company to One Cause. And maybe that gave them the confidence that there was a market out there or there was a potential and, and for capital. And, and there was. And so capital is that, that other kind of aspect that you need for an ecosystem. And now we have grown. The company that was started back in 2008 is BidPal. Now we're about, we're over 250 strong across the country with 150 plus here in Indy. And then I would say you need infrastructure and culture to, to also facilitate and support an ecosystem. And you've got the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at IU here. You can actually get an undergraduate degree in philanthropic studies, which I think is fantastic. And it's probably unique uh, in the country. And then ultimately, you know, I'm a Chicago guy. I came, I came down to Indianapolis from Chicago. But one of the things that my wife and I both noticed when we came down here is that people truly care. And I think that's also rooted in Indianapolis culture. And so whether it's faith-based like Givelify or whether it's cause or community-based like Onboard and Boardable and One Cause, I'd say people, people here want to do, want to do, they want to do good. They want to make a positive impact. And, you know, of course we want to, we want to do financial, we want to do well financially as well, but I don't think that that has to be mutually exclusive, right? You, but you don't find that in every city that also has a vibrant tech community. I think the second part of your question was what kind of like uh, knowledge sharing is going on. I would say that, you know, guys like Jay and Jeb Banner, who was one of the founders of Boardable, they were the first to welcome me to Indy. When I first moved sh from Chicago, we had lunch, we hung out, we shared stories. And then later, we actually maybe solidified that more. And we met, uh, we talked about best practices for human resources, a little CEO group running companies that had nonprofits as customers and, and, and little hint, it's different than supporting commercial organizations. And so we shared best practices and, you know, I would say that, you know, the pandemic put a stop to that, but it was um, really good to, to kind of get together as a little CEO support group uh, yeah. for, uh, you know, leaders who are running uh, companies that had nonprofits as customers. Yeah. Well, I mean, just being a CEO can be a lonely job. Not that I've ever done it, but I've talked to a lot of yeah. CEOs. So being able to talk to another CEO where you kind of let your guard down is, is a, certainly a, a great advantage. But then to have the added bonus to be able to talk to CEOs that, that not only understand the role of CEO, but your, your space, that has to be a great uh, advantage. It's a, it's a great thing. And you have to, to your point, you have also have to create the safe space where you can come together and you can share best practices and you're, you're kind of competing a little bit, but really, you know, I, you, if you believe in an abundance mentality versus a scarcity mentality, you can come and say, there's enough success for all of the, for all of us. Let's just work together and let's share our best practices and let's help each other be successful. Cause you're right. You know, we as CEOs, we're often expected to have all the answers. And, you know, again, we oftentimes don't. And that's, again, fundamentally uh, what's behind a lot of the, the vulnerability that, that I write about and the vulnerability that I hopefully show um, in the book, Fearless. Yeah. And that, uh, that spirit of collaboration among, among individuals, among organizations, among companies is a theme that I just see over and over again in Indiana, and I've been here all my life, uh, and I've been involved in tech for quite some time, mm -hmm. that I think is really one of our advantages. So I was glad that you were able to, to take advantage of that. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, you were not the original founder of One Cause, which was then called BidPal at the time. Uh, you previously founded or had been involved with several successful companies, many of them in the, in the music industry. Um, what was it about the opportunity at One Cause that, that motivated this shift in your career? So, so the first part of my career was pretty corporate. And that was, that was about 15 years. I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I actually worked for the Coopers side of that, Coopers and Librand, and then at Gateway. And, and Gateway was probably a Fortune 100 company at the time. And when I say Gateway, maybe there's younger listeners out there who don't remember who Gateway is, but yeah. it's a computer company with a cow spotted boxes yep. uh, at that gateway. Yep. Exactly. I think we all kind of had our first taste of technology. And so yep. what, what gateway really introduced me to Roger was this intersection of, and I, and I say, it's the intersection of technology and fill in the blank. And we were, we were working at the intersection of technology and home entertainment and home productivity, technology and music and technology and education. 
And then in the meantime, I ran an early stage venture accelerator for about eight years. And we invested and started up 19 companies during that time. And they were working on a lot of really important uh, and really important discoveries. And like you said, I started two technology-based music companies, managing, I managed a band, I ran a production company. And as I look back at that, I thought, man, what was I thinking? I, that is very an eclectic background. Yeah. So, sure. so fast forward through all of that, you know, joining what was called BidPal at the time. It came at a time in my career when I was seeking, I'm going to say, more joy or fulfillment in my career. I had come, it, it came right when, when I had turned 50, I almost said 40. <laughs> I had just turned 50. My kids who were my original why or my reason for doing what I was doing were now out of the house. They didn't need me anymore. They were successful and I was searching and I didn't know what for. And as, as my story goes, my why story goes, I was reading this Wired Magazine article with Bill Ga Gates and, Cl and Bill Clinton on the cover. And they were telling the story of using their wealth and power and influence from their first careers to do good and their second careers. And I was literally, I was on the beach with my wife and I literally, I turned to her and said, that's it. That's what I'm missing. I need purpose in my career. I need bigger mission or a reason. I need a bigger why. And so, you know, when you decide what it is that you want or you need, when it comes across the radar, then you're able to identify it. And one cause came across my radar about six months later. And in that moment, I knew that that was what I wanted, that that's what I was, I was looking for. And so I look at like one cause is the continuation of this intersection between technology and you, you used, um, I like your terminology of giving tech earlier. I call it like technology and generosity. So we, we trademarked technology for good a few years ago. So it's about helping nonprofits, thousands of nonprofits raise over a billion dollars a year for their causes. And like, when I look at that at the end of the day, I don't think it gets any better than that. I think it's like, if you had a superpower and you said, I'm, how am I going to use my superpower for good? I think that's a perfect, one cause is a perfect example of that. And I couldn't be happier to be uh, where I am today after that eclectic background. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so you were involved with a lot of different companies um, uh, and you mentioned some of them specifically, but what what about these experiences? Um, what, what from these experiences have informed the success that you've had at one cause? And then what are some of the leadership lessons that you've learned over the years? And I'm sure that'll be kind of a segue into your book, but but tell me about a little bit about some of those leadership lessons you've learned over the years. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I guess what I would say is I have had the outstanding fortune of having really quality mentorship along my journey. And two mentors really stand out to me. First of all is Rick Snyder. Rick, I, I, I met him early in my career. He started as my boss. He became my venture partner. He's now a friend. And what I learned from Rick was this deep, thoughtful, intellectual decision-making based on research and analysis and lots of Excel spreadsheets. And that was kind of, that was kind of his specialty. And then from Ted Waite, who was the founder of Gateway, who's a true visionary and friend, I learned things like instinct and going with your gut and maybe doing a little bit of gunslinging along the way, just really two opposite spectrums of, of going at it. And I've taken those learnings and I've paid them forward and I've been a mentor to young entrepreneurs. And so what I'd say is, hey, you young up and comers, find a mentor if you don't already have one. And old timers like me, um, find someone, uh, take them under your wing, help them along their journey. Um, they've got a lot of energy. You've got a lot of knowledge. Put those things together and see what you can do. I've worked with a lot of big companies and small companies, and I'd say the other thing from a leadership lesson, lesson standpoint is, man, you got to allow for change. And who I was 20 years ago is not who I am today as a leader. And in order to have done what, what I was able to do together with the company and the leadership of the company and, and getting through the global pandemic was, was, let's say, this version of me, I'm more contemplative. I'm more thoughtful. I'm more mindful. I'm a little bit more patient. My wife might disagree, but that's not who I was 20 years ago. But I needed Steve, today's version of Steve, uh, to be the leader um, at who you see show up in one uh, in, in Fearless. Yeah. So speaking of leadership lessons, uh, 
You recently published your first book, uh, Fearless Leadership Lessons at the Crossroads. And of course, I'm wearing your shirt even too uh, today. Nice. Um, I appreciate that. Thanks for giving it to me. But uh, what, what made you decide to write a book and, and what does it mean to be a fearless leader? First of all, I appreciate you calling it my first book. It is truly my first book. I don't think I'll probably write a second book, but you never, never, you never know. <laughs> you may go through another book so and you may have to start writing I, another book, but hopefully not. 